hello and welcome everyone to the DOD EDIS Early Intervention Services webinar series. My name is Jane Dooley and I am the technical host. Before I turn it over to our presenter, Dr. Naomi Youngren, I have a few brief housekeeping items for everyone. Um, in addition to viewing the presentation from your computers there, a copy of the slide deck was emailed out to registrants about an hour prior to the session. We're going to be presenting the materials um, over the next 60 to 90 minutes or so, and then we're going to follow that up with a question and answer period. Dr. Youngren is going to stop periodically to take questions throughout the session. Today's session is also being recorded and is going to be available in a few weeks, and a communication is going to be forthcoming about where you can access that recording. Just to let folks know, I think we might be caught up. We have the first, I, I know we have the first three, and I want to say the fourth one um, may be out there as well already, approved and up at Military One Source Stop Mill under the webinars page under archives um, is where you can find uh, under the webinar archives is where you can find the recordings from the previous session so if you need to take a listen to that you can go back out there and take a listen to that so that is what I had in terms of housekeeping let me just read this very quick disclaimer and then I can turn it over to our presenter Dr. Youngren but just so folks know that the appearance of hyperlinks does not constitute endorsement by the Department of Defense of this website or the information, products, or services contained therein for other than authorized activities such as military exchanges and morale, welfare, and recreation sites, the Department of Defense does not exercise any editorial control over the information you may find at these locations. Such links are provided consistent with the stated purpose of this DOD-sponsored webinar. So that's what I had in terms of housekeeping. Oh, and I had one other quick comment for you. Dr. Youngren um, did put throughout the presentation here um, some hyperlinks to uh, access the materials. And for those of you that are in here in the meeting, those links are going to be live during the session. So um, as we go and we get on, as we advance to those slides, you'll notice that if you do actually hover over the screen and hover over the link, that will be a live link for you. So if you would like to go ahead and jump and uh, access those materials uh, in meeting here, you can go ahead and do so um, just to help save time there. OK, so that's what I had. Dr. Younger, and I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, and welcome, everybody, and Happy New Year. I hope everybody had an enjoyable holiday break, um, whether you were home, away, or visiting family and friends. I'm going to advance the slides here a little bit. Um, I'm also looking forward to this year our continued EDA standardization efforts in 2014. It's hard to believe it's already 2014. Today, we're going to continue our DOD IFST webinar series. We are on series, uh, webinar number five of seven that we're going to be doing. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the requirements for measuring child and family outcomes. This is the national initiative. I'm going to briefly provide you with some background information about this initiative, this information um, that we're going to cover about the background is not included in the IFST uh, process guidance handbook. We will also spend some time exploring how the child outcome summary, the cost process, is embedded into the IFST. And we are going to be taking some time to review the process for documenting present levels of development, which is often referred to as the PLOD in the IFST process. In the IFST guidance handbook, we are covering pages 44 through 52. But as I mentioned, some of the background information that we're going to talk about with regards to child outcomes uh, and family outcomes is not included. OK, here we are in the process. We're going to do things a little bit different this time because we're going to move the child measurement before we talk a little bit more about the plot. And the reason for that is that we're going to talk about how child outcome measurement is integrated into the IFSP process. So I'm going to talk first about that, and then we'll begin to look at the present levels of development. I'm also thrilled to have a couple of colleagues with me here today um, to talk a little bit about integrating outcomes and also the, the plot process. So let's start off with the oh, here we are. Let's start off with a poll question. This is about your familiarity with the national initiative on measuring child and family outcomes to understand the results of early intervention. So please take a moment to document your level of familiarity with that. All right. 
Well, it certainly looks like the vast majority are very familiar with the process. Um, there's a few more that are somewhat familiar, a couple that have heard about it. Um, I'm happy to see that um, we don't have anybody registered yet on, on D, not sure what, what, I, what I'm talking about. Um, I am going to go ahead and provide you with a little bit of background on here um, and invite you, if you do have questions, to please use the, to please use the chat box. So the question has been asked before, why do we measure early intervention results? We know that we've got a good idea that programs are doing a fine job and that families are generally happy. And I would venture to believe that each and every one of you could probably share several stories about the, possible, uh, about the positive changes that you've seen for children and families as a result of their participation in EDIS early intervention services. And I would anticipate that there are many, many families that could also share similar stories. Yet these type of data are not systematic or program-wide. They're great anecdotal accounts and stories and are important to recognize those, but they do not provide the program-wide systematic data, which is why it is that we're collecting this information. There is a big emphasis on making sure that policymakers, resource managers, and other stakeholders have an understanding of what difference does early intervention make for children and for families. So there is a big focus on this return on investment. Um, and the data that we've collected traditionally has not gotten at the results of early intervention for children and families. I'm going to move on and talk a little bit more about how this came to be. This all really came about um, in part as a result of the Government Performance and Results Act of 1993, referred to as GEPRA, which requires federal agencies to establish a set, a set of indicators to judge the effectiveness in meeting their identified goals. So what happened, it was back in 2002, there was a review of the Part C program. And this was conducted by the Office of Management and Budget, OMB. And they used a program called a, a, a program assessment rating tool, a part. And the results of that were basically a zero with regards to Part C's showing results accountability. Specifically, the findings were that the review of Part C um, determined that certainly the programs had met their goals with regards to the number of children served. Um, but it had not collected information about how well the program was doing to improve the educational and developmental outcomes for infants and toddlers served. So back then in 2003 is when the Office of Special Education Programs began to ask states for their child outcome data. And as you might well expect, there wasn't a whole lot. So there were also, at that time, was the beginning development of the Early Childhood Outcome Center. And in 2004, the Early Childhood Outcome Center convened some stakeholder meetings and requested public comment on ideas and um, initiatives for measuring child outcomes. Then in 2006 and 2005, uh, the Office of Special Education released revisions to the actual reporting requirements that states were going to use for reporting. It was 2007 that the state started to report their entry data. And they reported entry data for the years of 2005 and 2006. And this is really when EDIS kind of came into the, um, into the mix on this, because we were about two years behind getting started with the states, but then caught up quickly. So from 2008 and there on, states are now reporting, as, as is EDIS, reporting their entry and exit data and looking at the results of early intervention. A little bit more about the DOD process. It was in, ninth, or excuse me, in 2006 that the DOD ICC agreed to require the measurement of child and family outcomes. It made revisions to the SNPMAS database. Perhaps some, some or many of you remember that. Um, and then as the lengthy process for revising the 1342 convened, the requirement for EDIS to measure child and family outcomes was included. Um, and you might be interested to know that that particular instruction is, in fact, in its final issuance process. Um, and it's out for public comment at this time. So a little bit of background on the child and family outcomes measurement requirement. Um, 
many of you probably remember, and, and we continue to do this today, is a lot of our compliance data were traditionally just that input kind of data. And by input, I mean you know how many children were served, how many services provided, did family receive their rights, uh, was, um, per were permission forms signed, those types of things. There was also satisfaction. Um, data collected as well, were families happy with services? But again, these data didn't get at telling us if or how early intervention is making a difference, um, did not get at demonstrating program effectiveness, and did not address the specific needs identified in um, IDEA Part C. So what we have now is we have the outcome data being collected, which includes statements about what early intervention strives to do for children and families. It includes the benefits experienced by children and families as a result of their involvement in early intervention. And these data are not simply measures of services received or satisfaction. They are really getting at the results. So really what we're wanting to see is what are the results of early intervention. Now, this data does not minimize the importance or relevance of other data collected. Rather, it helps programs and other stakeholders understand if we are achieving the desired results of early intervention for children and families. We're going to take a poll question now. A bit of a check across the, across the participants with regards to what are the three national child outcomes that are measured not only across EDIS programs, but across early intervention programs um, within the United States. So these are the three national early childhood outcomes that are measured across all early intervention programs in EDIS and across the United States. OK, and the correct answers are A, children acquire and use knowledge and skills, D, children take action to meet their needs, and E, children have positive social relationships. The other ones that are included here, certainly we collect data and we look at those, but those are not the three, they're not part of the three national outcomes that help us to understand if we are achieving the intended results for early intervention. Okay, moving on. I do want to share with you some national data. Uh, included here is the URL, and Jane said that we can just click on this and it'll bring us to that particular website. So I'm going to go ahead and give that a try. And oh, you know what? For you, for you oh. ex, for it'll you know what it's going to do, Naomi. Is it's going to launch for everyone individually. Okay. So if folks want no. to individually. Okay. It, it, and in fact, Jane, it did work. <laughs> so that's kind of exciting. Um, but I okay. I'm I'm back to the slides here now. All right. So if you do click on that URL, it will open up another, another page and you'll be able to see it. But included here is a glimpse at the recent Early Childhood Outcomes publication on outcomes for children and served through, through IDEA's Early Childhood programs. And these data are for 2011 and 2012 reporting period. This report includes the results for early intervention and preschool programs for children with disabilities, as in the states outside of the DOD. The Part B preschool programs, three to five, are also required to report on these three child outcomes. Um, in the DOD, that's not the case. I do encourage you to review this document and um, begin to see the value of the data collected for program improvement, as well as the uh, stakeholder information that can be gleaned from it. I'll move on and share with you also um, a bit of Army data that's collected. Included here is a glimpse at part of the data collected across Army EDIS programs. Um, and I'm excited as we move towards greater standardization, we'll be looking at this across EDIS programs um, and not, um, well, certainly we can look at it in a variety of different ways, but we'll have this data aggregated across EDIS programs, which will be pretty exciting. Interesting, you'll notice if you look at these data relative to the report that you just um, link to the URL there, these data are similar to the nationally reported data. Specifically, what you've got here on the screen are, this shows the percentage of children who demonstrated greater than expected growth across the three outcome areas. So 
these are the three outcome areas. Um, outcome one, social relationships. Outcome two, knowledge and skills. And outcome three, taking action to meet needs. These data have been collected for the various different reporting periods that are included here. So these data represent the percentage of children that were acquiring skills at a faster rate when they left the program than when they began. So that means basically this is the percentage of children that changed their developmental trajectory. They entered the program with skills below age expected and entered the program with skills either closer to children functioning um, same age peers or actually achieve functioning of same age peers. And the percentages run right around um, between 60 and 70 percent, a little bit higher, um, particularly last year with regards to action to meet needs. Um, one of the things that we look at with data checking patterns is the stability of data over the years. Um, and we don't have a, a huge amount of fluctuation within each of these outcome areas, which is nice to see. So just to get a sense of the type of data that are collected from the early childhood outcomes, um, initiatives. And each of you that have um, access to your SNPMIS data, there are reports within SNPMIS that you can review and look at um, to get a better sense of where it is that, that your program is at relative to national data and certainly relative to um, program-wide data. I hope that in the future we'll have time to spend a little bit more time um, talking about um, and reviewing the data, because certainly one of the things that we want to make sure is that we've got um, high, high data quality. With regards to a bit more background on the early childhood um, child outcomes and the initiative, is the reinforcement that these are represent integrated development. So as you see across the top here um, is the overarching goal. One of the overarching goals that we want to see with regards to um, the outcomes for children participating in early intervention services. You've got here the three outcomes. And the intent with this particular table is to reinforce how these three outcomes do, in fact, form a bit of an umbrella if you look at it from the, from the perspective of um, what Dr. Robin McWilliam refers to as functional areas, social relationships, engagement, independence. Um, also looking at it from the perspective of the five developmental domains, that each of these three global child outcomes do encompass information from all of the domains, in, in, encompass skills and behaviors from um, these functional areas, as well as skills and behaviors from um, the common core early childhood curricular areas, which are listed there at the bottom. One of the things that's important, um, as you all likely know is that there is no direct um, mapping, if you will, from the five domains of development to the three outcomes. So for example, communication, all communication skills don't fall within this outcome area. All cognitive skills don't fall within this outcome area, but rather it's more integrated development. One example of that is to think about communication skills. So communication skills are going to fall here under positive social relationships when we talk about social communication. Communication skills are going to fall within this outcome area, which is children um, acquiring used knowledge and skills when we think about the acquisition of language and communication skills. And communication is going to fall within the third outcome area, too, with regards to children using communication to get their needs met. So you'll see that these domains of development um, can, in fact, cut across the three outcome areas, which reinforces this point about integrated development. Another piece we've talked about before, but a bit more of the um, background of the three child outcomes, is that the three child outcomes being measured across early intervention programs are functional. They are not domain-based, as we just illustrated. And they are not separate child separating the child into discrete areas or skills, but rather they refer to behaviors that integrate um, developmental skills into meaningful contexts. So the emphasis is on functional skills and how the child is able to carry out meaningful behaviors in meaningful contexts. And ultimately, what we'd like to see is um, 
the, get an understanding here with the child's ability to carry out or carry out skills or the knowledge that they need in order to function successfully across a variety of settings and ultimately be successful in later school. I know we've talked about functional outcomes before, so I think we're ready to move on to a poll question specifically with regards to this reinforcing this concept of functionality. And certainly a component of functionality is contextual relevance. So please take a moment now to look at the poll, and you're going to identify the skills that are listed here of A through H. Which ones represent functional skills? All right, I still see a couple more folks answering the poll. Okay, so the ones that are functional are A, and certainly the majority of you chose A, B, E, and G, which certainly matches up with the poll. The majority of folks chose that. Um, a few folks chose D, um, displays a three chuck grasp. Um, what this really looks at is an isolated skill. So if the child is able to do that, how does they use that functional in a meaningful context? Because the way it's stated right here is just an isolated, uh, it's just an isolated skill. What we want to look at is the function of that skill in a meaningful context. The other one that can sometimes be a stumbler here is the H has a vocabulary of one to three year, blah, blah, one to three words. Um, what we want to look at here is how does he use that functionally? So what's missing here to make this be um, functional is what is the context and how is the child using that in a meaningful way. So functional outcomes refer to things that are meaningful to the child in the context of everyday living and represent an integrated series of behaviors or skills that allow the child to, in, um, to complete a, a task that is, is meaningful. All right. Any, any questions or debates with any of those? All right, I don't see a whole lot in the chat box. We're going to move on now to look a little bit closer um, and, and very briefly at the three outcome areas that we just talked about. We talked about the outcome children have positive social relationships. And within the context of each of these three child outcomes that are being measured across early intervention programs, there are three pillars. So three kind of major grouping areas that are included within the overall within the overall outcome. So here's the second one, children acquire and use knowledge and skills. And you'll see the three general pillar areas. And then the third one is children take appropriate action to meet their needs and the three pillar areas again. What I'd like to do now is refer you on to the resources that are included in your handbook. This is part of a table that provides some detailed information about those main pillars that are associated with this outcome. And this outcome is the first one, positive social relationship. Um, also included are descriptions of what is included um, within the context of this outcome and some considerations for thinking about the child's um, functioning relative to this outcome. The table is not meant to show all of the possible ways that the outcome would be demonstrated across the age span, birth to three, or across the range of abilities. But it does provide a good basis for understanding the skills and behaviors aligned with each of the outcomes. Um, and this can also be a valuable tool to use when you are writing your present levels of development, which are going to be organized around the three outcome areas, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, in just a minute. So you'll see here is the reference to the outcome statement, and then here included is the three, the three pillars that we talked about. And then some considerations for describing how the child, and then there's a list of elements, or consider how the child does these things across settings, um, and then some additional kinds of questions, um, how does the child, and then there's a list of, of questions that are associated um, with skills that link with this particular outcome area. All right, and this is on page 46 of the IFSP Guidance Handbook. I think it's time for a poll. Since you guys are doing so well with these, this 
is going to be a poll where you are going to choose from the list below and identify the skills and behaviors that would fall within outcome one positive social relationships. And you can choose more than one item here. So which of these skills that are listed, A through H, would fit within the context of the first outcome positive social relationship? OK, I think we're ready. And the answers are A, which gets at positive social relationships, separating from other. B, and many of you chose both of those. D is the other one, plays alongside um, sister. We're looking at social interactions and play. The next one is F, repeating action to get mother's attention, what it is that I'm doing to initiate those social interactions. And G, um, tucking behind mother when meeting new people. So it's A, D, A, B, D, F, and G, which are the correct ones here. Um, several people had chose here E, imitate. Um, this one actually is going to fall under outcome number two when we think about acquiring and using knowledge and skills. Um, so we think about how children um, imitate and learn from what they see other people doing. So that one is actually going to fall under outcome number two. All right, any questions with that? I know for many of you this is, this is a bit of a review. We've gone through these um, or other types of questions before. But I think it's important to reinforce um, and, and to check as well our understanding of the, the breadth and depth of what fits within the context of each of the outcomes. OK, any questions or debates with this one? OK, we're going to move on then. And we're going to move on to outcome number two. You'll see the similar table here. Um, here's reference to the outcome number two. Um, the, it includes the, the three main pillars and descriptors to assist you with understanding the depth and breadth of this particular outcome area, which is acquiring and using knowledge and skills. This table is split. It's included on pages 46 and 47 of the guidance handbook, uh, which you can use as a tool to assist you with writing the present levels of development. Are you ready for the next poll? OK. Thanks, Jane. All right, here it is. Similar to the one we just did, except for this time what you're going to do is you're going to look at, at from the list below, identify the child's skills and behaviors that would fall within outcome two, which is acquiring and using knowledge and skills. And if you like, don't hesitate to use your resource. Um, we're on page 46 and 47 of the IFSC guidance handbook. All right, there's a couple more responses coming in. OK, so here we go. This is with regards to outcome number two, acquiring and using knowledge and skills. And the skills and behaviors that fit under this one are A, uses a few true words. This gets at language um, acquisition. The next one is C, explores mobiles by looking at them and reaching up towards them. Um, so this is how it is that the child is learning about mobiles and what it is that he can do with them. D, follow simple one-step directions, so that responding to simple directions and things like that is going to fit under outcome number two. E is included in this one as well, names pictures in a, in a familiar book. So all of those pre-literacy, um, early reading skills fit within this outcome area. And the last one is G. Pretends to feed the baby doll and puts it to sleep. So here we're looking at play skills. Um, don't, get, don't get caught up just because it's talking about eating and sleeping. Um, if this were about the child's ability to eat independently or um, go to sleep, that would be outcome three. But here we're talking about pretend play skills um, with the baby doll. So that would be outcome number two. So. The answers for this one are A, C, D, E, and G. A couple of you chose B, climbs up into his high chair for meals. This really fits under outcome number three, taking action to meet needs. 
and how it is that he's getting about. And let me take a peek here at the poll. There was a couple folks that chose F, repeating action to get parents' attention for praise. That would be outcome number one, um, looking at that social interaction component. And the last one, H, uses a fork to eat. What outcome do you think that would best fit under? Any guesses? All right, I see some threes, and you're absolutely right. That would fit under outcome number three. Excellent. OK. We have one more outcome. I'm going to just pause for a minute. I think Jane was going to try to capture that. All right, so what's the next outcome area? Yes, you're right. It is outcome number three, taking action to meet needs. So in this third outcome area, again, you've got the table similar to the other two outcomes. You've got information that's included here about what the outcome is, what the outcome area is called, taking appropriate action to meet needs. You've got reference to the three pillars, um, and then more breadth and depth information about what are the different types of skills and behaviors that fit within the context of this particular outcome. All right, are you ready for the poll? Similar to like we had just done. OK, here we go. So from the list below, identify the child skills and behaviors that would fall within outcome three, taking appropriate action to meet needs. Which ones here are going to fit within outcome number three? OK, I think you all were a little quicker with this one. Perhaps there's a little bit um, easier understanding with this one. So the answers are A, climbs up into a high chair, B, walks independently, D, uses a fork, E, points to request for candy from the candy jar, and H, knows not to touch the stove because it's hot. So all of those safety components are going to fall within this particular outcome area, taking appropriate action to meet needs. This one here might have been a little bit of a stumbler because it talked about some um, self-care kinds of skills, but the focus is here we're pretending to do some of those things. So the emphasis here um, is on learning to pretend to brush hair or to brush teeth or talk on the phone, so maybe even imitating what others are doing. So this one here, the way it is, would fall under which outcome do you think? So pretending. Any guesses on that? Yes, two, absolutely. So this one would fall under outcome two. This one here, F, shakes and bangs toys. Um, I guess just two people chose that one. That one would also fit under outcome number two. And C was another one that didn't fit. Um, nobody chose this one, but that would fit under outcome number two as well. OK. I'm going to move on, unless there are any debates or questions about any of those particular skills um, or any other um, thoughts with regards to the breadth and depth of what's included in each of the three outcome areas. OK. So moving on, and this is also included in your IFSP handbook, uh, the costs. Before this used to say child outcome summary form. It used to be the COFF. You probably remember that. Um, the reason it's changed is because the emphasis is more on the summary process versus just a form. So not only in our program, but several programs across the United States have changed that emphasis as well. So the cost rating, really what it does is it reduces all of this kind of rich information that you gather from various different sources about the child's functioning. It reduces all of that rich information into a common metric, which is one point on the seven point scale for each of the three outcome areas. And certainly information to complete that cost and generate the rating is going to require this kind of rich information from all of those great resources and things that you're doing to gather information and understand the child's functioning. The next slide I want to show you before I turn this over to a couple of colleagues is the seven-point scale. And this is one illustration that's been used by the Early Childhood Outcome Center to um, speak about the seven-point scale. 
this yellow circle in the middle represents those with age-expected behavior. Um, certainly, this includes quite a range of skills. Um, and by definition, most children in the general population would fit into this yellow circle. And then if you look, there's kind of this um, darker yellow circle that's kind of right on the fringe. Um, these are the kids that are demonstrating some age-expected skills, but perhaps they have some skills that are age-expected now, but don't appear to be gaining new skills at a rate or in a quality that parallels other children his age. So all of these yellow areas here, so this represents the seven, this represents the six, those are in fact age-expected skills. And then as you move further out from that age-expected population, you're moving further away from age-expected skills. So here's your five, your four, your three, your two, and your one. And the assumption is that children can be described with regards to how close they are to age-expected functioning for each of the three outcome areas. All right, I'm going to do a quick poll now. And this is regarding the seven-point scale and your familiarity with the seven-point scale. Um, please use the options here to report on your familiarity with the seven-point scale. All right, so 40, 50, 60. I'm going to wait for a couple more people to respond. Let's see if we can get a little bit closer to, to 70. All right. So clearly what we see is the, um, the, the vast majority, 70% are saying that they are very familiar. Um, a few more folks are saying, um, a, a, few, a few folks are saying somewhat familiar, and then we've got a few that are, haven't heard of it or not sure what I'm talking about. So this understanding of the seven-point scale is certainly a key component to understanding um, measuring early childhood outcomes and this, and this measuring outcomes initiative. All right. And if we had more time, we could go into greater detail. Uh, again, uh, there are some resources, and I certainly encourage you to take a look at the Early Childhood Outcomes Center, um, the resources that are in your IFSC handbook as well. OK. This is a glimpse. Ooh. Um, I just want to highlight this is the 2009 map. There is a newer map um, from December 2013 that I guess didn't get integrated. Um, and I understand how that can happen. It, so the, the newer map has changed just a little bit. But let me tell you just briefly um, what this is. I can send you the URL for the newer map. Um, what this looks at is it looks at states' approaches to measuring child outcomes. And this is for Part C programs. And I just want to highlight to you that the green states, and we would be uh, amongst those green states, and certainly the vast majority of states across the nation are using the child outcome summary process and the seven-point scale to look at measuring child outcomes. So again, not to dwell too much on this, um, some of these have changed a little bit. Um, some have moved from um, other or one state tools to um, using the child outcome summary. So for example, all of these um, outlying states are net, all of these outlying islands and such are now using the child outcome summary. And some of these others have changed as well. So certainly the vast majority of the states have employed the child outcome summary process, as has um, our EDIS program. OK. Let me highlight two other resources that are, in fact, included in your IFST guidance handbook. Um, this one here on the left-hand side is the decision tree. Uh, this is a very helpful resource for helping to generate what is the rating. Um, so it asks some questions, does the child have any functioning that would be considered age expected with regards to the outcome that we're talking about? And that helps you decide, no. If it's no, we're going to be at a rating of 1 through 3. If it's yes, we're going to be at a rating of 1 through 4. And the subsequent questions help you to drill down to whatever the appropriate rating would be. Very, very helpful resource. The other one is the bucket list, um, affectionately referred to as the bucket list, 
which includes sort of a visual description of the rating. So here you see um, for a rating of seven, um, if you think about the mix of skills that a child has um, across age expected, which is your AE, um, you'll see here IF, which is immediate foundational, which are the skills that come just before age expected, and then there are F skills, which are foundational, which are really skills like that of a very much younger child. So this notion here with the bucket list is you think about the child, the mix of skills a child has, and in this particular case with a rating of seven, um, the mix of skills a child has with regards to an outcome area all are within the age expected bucket. So that would be a rating of seven. Um, a rating of six here, the skills are all age expected, but there's maybe just a little bit of a concern. So if you look closely, there's a little bit of a wavering of the um, of the line here for age expected. Five, what you've got is more of a mix of you've got many age expected skills, but a few immediate foundational. When you move down to the four, you've got some age expected, but you've got more immediate foundational. And three is where you sort of cross that line from now we see that there aren't any age expected skills, but there are several immediate foundational, a few foundational. And then when you get to two, there's fewer immediate foundational and more foundational, and, F, um, and one is all foundational. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit more about this, about this bucket list as well. But these are two resources that are included in your handbook on page 50 and 51 that are going to be helpful for you. OK, let's move on, because I want to turn this over to my colleague, Jeanette Guerrero, who's going to talk with us a little bit more about outcomes integration. But before I turn it over to Jeanette, I just want to highlight um, two particular resources with regards to outcomes integration. Um, initially, when Edith started with the child outcomes process, outcome, this wasn't integrated into the IFSP. Um, it was something that was done outside of the IFSP process. Um, and it didn't take too long before we realized that the data were really not being collected systematically or consistently. Um, and began to look at how do we integrate it into the IFSP process. So um, Edith actually was at the table with several other states that were looking at this at about the same time. And here included our, this first URL is for a presentation on the outcomes integration project. Um, this next one is a flow chart that was developed by a national think tank that was convened to think about how can outcomes integrated into the IFSP process. So this is really a helpful resource um, that has been adopted um, across many states as well. So at this point, what I would like to do is turn it over to my colleague, Jeanette Guerrero, who is coming from the Launch Tool Program um, and has recently arrived in the Launch Tool Program. So Jeanette, would you speak to us just a little bit more about um, this whole notion of integrating outcomes into the IFSP process? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yes, I'm fairly new to EDIS. I've been here for right about a year. And prior to, to coming to EDIS, I worked in an early intervention program in one of the other green states <laughs> that was using um, the COSIP that came out of the, the um, ECHO Center. And I remember in 2005, 2006, when we started hearing about it and set out to implementing it that I think we really struggled with kind of adding it into the IFSP process. It definitely felt like something extra. It was another step and another form to fill out that didn't really, we couldn't figure out a, a way to make it really relate well to the process and to fit it in within that already short 45-day timeline because our direction was to do it after the evaluation and eligibility determination, but prior to the final completion of the IFSP document. Um, and so it became, again, just, just another, an extra thing to do. And I don't think people understood um, the value, or the intended value of it. Um, I think we understood the rationale of why we needed to have these outcomes um, but it was really hard to integrate it into the process in a meaningful way. Um, it turned into really brief conversations with families um, 
that I don't think was probably helpful to them. Um, I don't know that it was helpful to to staff or programs the way it should have been. Um, and so it really just, it, it, it felt extra, um, something we did on the side. And even when I left a year and a half ago, there had been changes that came over the, the years as we tried to incorporate changes and um, do, make it more meaningful. But I don't think we had gotten there yet. And then when I came to Edith and learned how it was integrated here, it made so much more sense. Um, it, it's truly part of the process. And now I can't imagine it not being built in the way that it is. I think when we do the RBI and um, then automatically continue sitting down with the evaluation team and talking about the outcomes and developing our present levels of development summary that way, it just it fits together so nicely and gets us out of thinking about children um, in little slices of those five developmental domains and thinks of describing them in more holistic ways. Um, we get that rating right at the beginning before intervention has started, and so we're able to then see at the exit what progress really has happened. Um, I think the present levels of development summary just kind of is a natural outcome or product of doing the RBI and then thinking about the outcomes and organizing it into those three outcome areas. The tools that you've, that you've described um, are, to me, key. I, I can't, I think that's kind of an additional way that sets it apart in making it um, a more standardized process, I guess, because using those descriptors and the decision tree and those, um, the descriptor statements gives everybody the same definitions and framework to put it in. And I think that was a big thing that we were not doing in the States very well, at least where I was. Um, so I don't think the integrity of the data is, is probably not very good at all um, where I was. I think it's much better here in the EDIS programs. Um, it feels it feels more productive and, a, and an actual useful and necessary step in the process here, the way it's integrated. Um, I think it helps us to paint a better picture of, of the child and the family. Um, it incorporates those those culminating statements, and so we're still carrying that th that thread through of the functional functionality of skills leading to functional outcomes. Um, it's not based on evaluation skills or discrete skills. Um, and I think it just really helps um, standardize the process and the rating um, in a way that I know we weren't getting to um, in the states where I was. Um, and I think for me personally, having the three kind of universal outcomes um, built in and integrated into the process the way we do it helps me to keep in mind what our overarching goal in early intervention is um, and gives me a, a nice framework to explaining it to families in that way, if that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, it, it does, and thank you so much, Jeanette. I think that's an important piece to, um, that you brought up, certainly throughout what you were saying, and I appreciate that. Um, but that reinforcement that this is really what, these are the goals, this is what we want to achieve in early intervention, um, and having that reminder and being able to share it with families is, is key. So thank you very much for sharing your, your perspective um, coming from a, a large state program to our to our EDIS program. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move on. Just as a reminder, as Jeanette was talking about, it is integrated into the IFSP process, and we collect the child outcome data as part of the natural early intervention process, as part of IFSP development, both initially and annually. Um, at exit, unless outcomes are measured within the past 60 days, or um, it, or if, um, or, and at exit rather, 
unless, of course, the family's been in the program for less than six months. If they've been in the program for less than six months, then we don't do exit ratings. So here's where we get to the IFSP, the functional ability, strengths, and needs, what we call present levels of development. The plot is organized by the three outcomes, like Jeanette was just talking about, and facilitates, like she had mentioned, the holistic picture, integrated development, emphasis on functionality, and I think Jeanette articulated that quite nicely, thank you, um, as well as making sure that that information is shared with families and it, that it isn't separate um, or held information from the family. This is a picture of the, IF, the new IFST, which you have a copy of. This is um, Section 7. And I just want to highlight, in this Section 7 on the IFST, there is an added statement that reinforces the reference to the three outcome areas. I'm not going to read it for you. You can certainly do that. But it does highlight um, that the present levels of development are organized around these three outcomes. Um, there is also reference in the statement about um, the rating. So in addition to considering your child's functioning relative to these three areas, we will also identify with you how your child is functioning relative to other children his age. Um, so this statement is included in the IFST, um, not necessarily to be read verbatim to the family, but perhaps more as a conversation starter to ensure that we are, in fact, sharing this information with families. Um, there's also a little nugget here where you just check the box that says you've shared with the family the measuring results and early intervention services trifold. Um, we want to make sure that they have a copy of that as well. You might have shared it with them earlier, but it's a nice little segue here um, to reinforce when you're talking about the present levels of development and the organization around those three outcome areas. At this point in time, I'd love to turn it over to another colleague of mine, um, Regina, who's coming from Schweinfurt. And Regina is also relatively new to the EDIS program um, and writing the present levels of development around the three outcome areas. Um, and she's going to talk with us a little bit about the documenting the plot. Are you ready, Regina? Yes. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Younger. And hi. Happy New Year, everybody. Can you hear me all right? If you could speak up a little bit, that would be great. OK. How's this? I'm getting closer to the phone. Yeah, get really close to the phone and yell a little bit. <laughs> OK. Let's see. How about that? I think that's better. We'll see what other people say. OK, I'm seeing a lot of no's. OK, one second. How about, hello? How about this? Yeah. This must have done it. That's, that's perfect. OK, I had to pick up the handset, take it off speaker. That's the key. I was, OK, I was Happy New Year, everybody. OK, so yes, just a little bit about my background. I'll keep this brief. Um, so I've been with Edith here in Europe. Going on a year, I arrived February 2013, um, and I came from Edis, mainland Japan, and I was there for two years. Um, I was really excited to come here, um, and I knew before I came that it was going to be a change with how I wrote the plot. <laughs> um, the information was online, and I was made aware of that. And so I was eager to learn the new way to do it. Um, let's see here. I was reading this comment, making sure it's not about the volume. OK, sorry. So um, yes, yeah, so um, for me, writing the, um, just a little bit of background the or in mainland Japan, they do it, um, or at least we did it, during the IFSP meeting we wrote the plot. So very different compared to here. Um, it's been a work in progress for me, and it's a team process, which is, you know, you're not doing this alone. Um, you have your teammates, which really makes a big difference. Um, I like to think of it, because um, it was a big shift for me, a big change in my mindset. I like to think of it as the screening section and the evaluation section of the IFSP PD has the concerns for the family, examples. Um, are often reinforced in the plot with, you know, supporting comments and whatnot. But you really get 
the plot information from a culmination, but a chunk of it I find comes from the RBI, the routine space interview, um, where you get that you know, functional, the current functioning information for the child and the family. So I won't get into too much, but I will say that um, the tools, as I said, it's been a work in progress for me, um, but the best tools, I feel, are the ones that um, are in this presentation. Um, the first one, um, the, with the three, uh, there were recent poll questions, um, slides 19, 21, and 23 about the um, outcome area on the plots. It was an activity that I had during a training, and I refer to that quite a bit. And we, it was nice that we walked through and did that activity. I know for a lot of us in Europe, we're pretty familiar with it, but for I'm, I'm mindful of the people that are going to be getting this information, so um, that are transitioning to the tri-service model. But uh, the other tool I use a lot of is the, um, of course, the slides 18, 20, and 22. The child, uh, where it has the child descriptors, considering uh, different settings with the um, graphs there. And I think I heard there in the handbook, page 46 and 47. So those are really helpful tools. I refer to them often. I uh, collaborate with my colleagues, and we're often looking at that. Um, I'd like to, are we doing OK on time? I'd like to read a snippet of um, a section of the outcome two, acquiring and using knowledge and skills, as an example for those people that may be, you know, new to this information. Is it okay, Naomi? Yeah, sure, please. Okay, thank you. So, um, for confidentiality reasons, I've um, taken out the Mr. and Mrs. and I'm going to refer to them as mom and dad, uh, and I've changed the name to Jay. So it's just a, one little snippet from um, the plot I've done recently. So one of Jay's, and again, this is for outcome area two. Um, one of Jay's favorite things to play with are puzzles. Dad commented, Jay is engaged during puzzles, and he's really hands-on. He won't look up during puzzles. Mom added, recently, Jay sat still for 17 minutes to put a t puzzle together. He was very focused. Jay also en enjoys stacking blocks and sorting shapes. Jay colors, draws, circles, and um, Name shapes. When he wants his parents to draw, Jay will say color, or when he wants to watch a movie, he will say castle to indicate a specific movie. Jay's parents shared Jay went through a brief phase of playing with a doll by placing it in a stroller and pushing it around and putting it in a doll crib. Jay prefers to play with toys and was reported to not sit still to look at books. While playing with toys, Jay's parents interact with him, but he likes everything specifically to play with things in his own way and in a certain manner. He can entertain himself for hours. If there's a distraction nearby, he will briefly check it out and decide if it's worth it. He usually continues with his play. Dad commented, for the most part, Jay's really energetic. He goes at top speed when playing, and when he's ready for rest, he crashes. Jay plays with his toys, wide-eyed and involved. Mom added, Jay can be a little intense in the way he focuses and wants to do things in his play. So that's just a little snippet. Um, um, and then, of course, I would, you know, and it, it sh I, I think the way we write them in Europe is, you know, it's beautiful. It's a great way to capture, you know, how the family sees their child and how they're currently functioning. And it's, you know, oftentimes parents say, oh, yeah, that's exactly like my child. You know, um, it's right there in black and white. And then, of course, we end each section with the um, culminating statement that is obtained from the bucket list. That's an, a helpful tool, which sums it up for the p families when you compare the child to um, peers. So then, as Jeanette, I think, believe, said, it you know, leads to functional outcomes. So I'm really, you know, pleased to be a part of you know, team where we do quality work, and I think it's much more beneficial for the families in this way. So I hope I covered everything. Are there any questions, or that's all I have? <laughs> any comments for Regina? Regina, thank you so much, and thank you for sharing one of your more recent um, uh, sections from Applaud. I, I think that whole notion of really being able to um, share the information with families and have families receive the information in a way that they say, 
Well, yeah, that's my kiddo. That's really what we want. We want things written in a way that's understandable. I know we've talked before, um, and I reinforce often the notion of being transparent with families. We certainly want that um, information shared. So thank you so very, very much, Regina. You're welcome. I'm going to move on fairly quickly now to, um, I'm not going to go through this one, but here are just some little um, Things to remember with regards to the plot, the present levels of development, some do's and some don'ts. Um, a lot of this gets at it, making sure that we're painting a real functional picture. Um, I also have included um, a couple of examples. And I'm just going to quickly point out some things in this first example. This is Annabella. Um, and the emphasis here is, is in your pods, like Regina had mentioned, is we want to make sure that there's functional information. So if you think about this one, it starts off, she's a darling little girl who's interested in learning. Um, you know, and if you think about it, the plot is supposed to support the rating. Does this really tell us anything about where this child is functioning at relative to age expected peers? It goes on and says she's aware of new situations. Well, what does that look like? She enjoys exploring her surroundings and likes playing with toys. Again, the focus here is, well, what does that look like? We need to get to um, the detail and the functionality. So the next one is she explores toys in a variety of ways. Um, again, we can read this, and we could all probably get a little bit different picture of what Annabella does. So a little caution here in this first example, sample number one, you see several nebulous statements or big, broad statements. In the second one that you have, and this one is going to be split across two different slides um, in the slide that, in the presentation that you received. Um, but I will invite you to take a look at this one. And I believe what you'll find is you'll see more examples that are included in here. Um, so she chooses to play with dolls and books. You get a sense of the types of toys that she gravitates towards. Um, you've got some information here about the different ways that she um, communicates. When you think about her acquisition of language, all of the different repertoires that she uses at this particular time. And then there are some things in here like, for example, um, this really does help to give a good picture of the child. So again, when you take a look at the do's and don'ts, you're going to see a lot of reference to making sure that you include a description of the child and what it is that they're doing beyond just big, broad statements. Because if you think about it, your, what you're writing in your present levels of development is, in fact, your supporting documentation for the rating. So when you move on and you finish writing your present levels of development, the next thing that you do is you add one of these culminating statements. So you go to the bucket list, and there are a couple of different options. So here under 7, there's a couple of different option culminating statements that equate to a 7. Um, for 5, there's one, two, three different culminating statements that apply to a 5. And you would choose one of those to put at the end of um, the plot section for each of the three outcomes. So here's an example. For a whatever month old child, Kelvin has many skills expected of his age, but he also demonstrates some skills slightly below what is expected of his age in requiring and using knowledge and skills. You'll see that there are um, elements here on the bucket list that are highlighted to kind of help you reinforce. So he's got many skills expected of his age. So that means he's got some age-expected skills, but he's got some skills that are slightly below. Because he's got age-expected skills, we know that he's at least a four or higher. He has some skills that are slightly below. So what you'll see is that equates to a five. And the next one equates to a three. I'm going to move on to a couple of poll questions before we, um, before we wrap up. Um, and these poll questions are also relative to the rating and the bucket list. So let's see how we do with this one. Here's the first one. What's the rating for the following culminating statements? Relative to other children Kelvin's age, there are no concerns. Watch for those highlighted areas. And he has all of the skills that we would expect of a child his age. What do you think the rating is? 
All right. Um, somebody chose H. <laughs> it's a seven-point scale. Anyway, the answer is seven. The answer is seven, and the vast majority have chosen seven for that one. Let's try another one. Here's another poll question. What's the rating for the following culminating statement? Kelvin has a few of the skills we would expect. So he has a few age expected skills with regards to whatever the outcome is. But he shows more skills that are not age appropriate. So we've got some skills, but more of them are immediate foundational. What do you think about this one? OK. Um, certainly, the vast majority are saying D, and that is correct. It is a four. So there are some skills age expected, but more skills are immediate foundational. So if you think about that bucket list, we've got some skills are age expected, but more skills are immediate foundational. You think about the mix of skills that he's got. All right. We've got one more poll question. And let's see, make sure I'm on the right one. So relative to same age peers, he is showing some nearly age expected. So he's showing some nearly age expected or immediate foundational skills, but have more skills that come in developmentally earlier. What do you think about this one? So he's got some immediate foundational, but more of the skills are those that come in much earlier. OK, and the vast majority here chose two, and that is correct or B, excuse me. So some immediate foundational, but many more that come in much earlier. So I, I hope with this particular activity, I do want to reinforce that the statements that are included in the bucket list here, these statements um, that equate to the rating, these statements really cannot be changed, with the exception, of course, is you're going to change the name Kelvin, or you'll write what is the um, what is the associated outcome. But otherwise, the statements don't change. And the reason for that is, as, as both um, as Jeanette had also mentioned, is, is to facilitate that standardization. So as you went through these poll questions, you read them and said, oh, OK, I know what that, I know what that rating is. All right. Um, moving on quickly, the child outcome summary, again, here you see um, less emphasis on the F part of it. It's really the child outcome summary process. The child outcome summary form is included here on the screen. Um, it does have to be completed by at least two people, so those names should be included here. It does include the B, the progress questions, that you will complete at annual and at exit. If, in fact, you are doing the child outcome summary and generating the rating for the different three outcomes at the time of the IFSP, you would simply mark the yes box here. And you do not have to have any additional supporting documentation. Because even when we started the process, there has to be some supporting documentation. Why did we choose it a two? And right now, because it's embedded in the IFSP process, our supporting documentation is included in the, um, in the plot and in the IFSP, so you would just mark yes. If, however, let's say the child is exiting the program at nine months of age, um, and you know that that, of course, doesn't fall within the context of developing an IFSP, um, then what you do is you complete the child outcome summary form and you complete the back of the form as well, where you document your supporting evidence. So this form continues to be part of the process. It's just when, when it's done as part of the IFSP process, it is a relatively simple process to complete that identifies who was involved and supports that, yes, the IFSP um, provides the additional documentation. And then if it's done outside of the IFSP process, the back of the form would be completed. Um, just a quick glimpse at the data collection in, the, in, in SNPMIS. Um, this particular screen shows you the rating at initial, so you'll notice that it's just the A questions, the B progress questions aren't included here. Um, but just a quick glimpse at um, the, how relatively simple this particular, this particular screen is. Okay, we have moved our way through this part of the IFSP in talking about 
um, measuring child outcomes, which is an integrated part of the IFSP process. Um, we had um, a look at the present levels of development and how we want to document that and include that good, rich information that gives us a real picture of where it is the child is at to support the rating and also to ensure that families, um, that that information is shared with families as well. All right, at this point, I am going to open it up for any additional questions. I see there's some chat going on in the box, which is great. Um, I'll open it up for any questions that anybody has or additional um, thoughts or perhaps even resources that folks have that they want to share. And just a reminder, if you'd like to verbally ask questions, you can hit star 2 to take your phone line off of mute, and Dr. Youngren will be happy to speak with you. Yeah, the, what we do want to make sure is that the rating process is completed with the team and that that information is reviewed with the family. It can't be just one person generating the rating. Um, as some of the folks in the chat box are saying it really does need to be um, a collaborative process and really think about, you know, does this child have any skills that are age expected? If so, what are they? Um, and then to be able to move on with the decision making process. All right, there's a few more people that are typing, but I also want to be respectful of your time, so I'm going to turn it, um, I'm going to turn on one more poll, and this particular one is your feedback. Oops. Actually, we're going to go ahead and change to a different slide uh, okay. for that, so real quick here. All right. Here we All right. Go. Thank you, Jane. And I'm actually going to do a pick this uh, poll to use. So make sure. Oh, hold on, hold on. Oh, oh, sorry, guys. I hold on. Don't vote yet. <laughs> Trying to find. The... There we go. There we go. So if you go, folks can take a moment and respond, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks a bunch, Jane. So please do take a moment to respond to the um, to this final poll question, um, similar to the questions we've asked before. Um, and please continue to use the chat box. As I did mention, we are keeping a collection of the chat conversations, and we'll have a subsequent webinar after this series of seven to address some of the questions that are raised in the chat. Um, and we'll have a mechanism to get back to you. Um, and to share other resources that might also be shared um, within the context of the chat. Before I bring it up to the, um, looks like we have the majority of the responses there. I'm going to hide that, and I know you want to move it to the next step. All right. So oh, yes, thank you, Jane. Um, Continue to vote on that previous poll. The question was usefulness, and you got your scale there. I want to highlight that our next webinar uh, series will be on January 14th and January 16th, um, Tuesday the 14th at 3, Thursday the 16th um, at 7 Germany time. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. You all can do the math and <laughs> figure out your local times. Um, it's the same time. It's the same URL. It's the same phone number. I will be send, You will be receiving a a sign in for the next webinar. You'll get that um, a little bit earlier this time. The next webinar, what it is that we're going to be covering is we're going to be moving on with the IFSP process, and we're going to be talking about um, IFSP outcome development. And there are some some fun changes with with that as well. So without, um, again, I certainly encourage you to continue to use the chat. We're going to stay online here for a little bit longer. I'm going to turn it over to, here's another um, resource on your screen. If you do have questions about contact, please don't hesitate to call me. Um, if you have some bits that you would like to share in the webinar, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, if you have any questions with regards to the webinar part of it, uh, the URL is included on there. It's MOS webinars at militaryonesource.mil. 
And Jane, I wonder if you want to turn it back to the final poll question to allow folks to that haven't had the opportunity to respond to that to, um, to go ahead and, and do that. Will do. Thank you. Um, and also just to note, um, I know there's some discussion in the chat box regarding <clears throat> copies of the PowerPoint presentations and, um, and whatnot. In that upper right-hand file pod is a copy of the guidebook, the handbook, and some of the supplemental documents that we've been touching on over the past sessions. Um, there is a copy of the slide deck from session four and session five. Um, it looks like somebody is looking for um, <clears throat> some of the slide deck information from the previous session. Um, and if you want to submit an email, I guess, Nurse, so that's if you want to send your email address. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, it's not Nurse. <clears throat> uh, Vivian, <clears throat> excuse me, Vivian Delgado, if you want to. Um, Submit your email in the chat box there. I will resend out um, presentations from the first three uh, sessions for you. And um, just to remind folks that you can continue to use those registration links, as um, Dr. Youngren mentioned. I did send out a second uh, email out. It went out to about 65 people. And um, so those folks, take a look in your email boxes. You should have a copy of the PowerPoint presentation there. Right. And, and certainly I see a, another comment here with regards to the child outcomes. This, um, what we covered today is really a, a kind of a scratching the surface of child outcomes and in no way is intended to be um, sharing all of the information that you need to really feel comfortable with, with all of it. So we certainly will be sharing some additional information um, with you with regards to measuring child and family outcomes because it is a fairly um, it is a bit of a complex process and, and recognized as such. So I will continue to encourage you to use the chat. We're going to stay online for a little bit. Um, I know some of you have a bazillion other things to do um, as you're coming back from the holiday. So I'll wish you a wonderful rest of the day and look forward to seeing you next week. Dr. Youngren, thank you so much. Um, yes, we will we'll leave the website open and continue to respond to any questions that come in online, but we will end the teleconference portion of the event at this time. And um, best of luck to all of you for the rest of your day and week, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.